I'm going to start today um, with a couple of caveats. One, there are uh, a few difficult to view images in this talk, uh, which largely revolves around um, around migrant death and um, and the aftermath of that. So just uh, I'll, I'll give you fair warning. And I'm going to start with a little bit a little bit of dialogue from my first day in the field conducting this research in uh, the summer of 2009. Flies. I mostly remember the goddamn flies. It's funny how memory works. I made a thousand mental notes of the scene and wrote a good many of them down soon after the event. But only a couple of years later, they now seem to be forgotten, buried, reduced to background noise. After spending just a few weeks on the U.S.-Mexico border, hanging out with a desperate people looking to breach America's immigration defenses, I quickly learned that death, violence, and suffering are par for the course. It all started to blur together. Disturbing images lost their edge. As an observer, you grow accustomed to seeing strangers cry at the drop of a hat. Tears no longer had the impact they once did. Tragic stories repeatedly told under the strain of a cracking voice transformed into well-worn hymns that lost their provenience and became difficult to seriate. I fought sensory overload so as not to lose sight of the big picture or the brutal details. I tried to write it all down so that I could later connect the observed realities to larger structural forces. This is at least what I kept telling myself I needed to do during my five years of fieldwork on the Arizona-Mexico border. It's what I told myself in this first encounter with death. But it's easier said than done. It didn't matter, though, because on this day in July 2009, none of it could be comprehended, much less theorized. All I could do was stare at the flies and wonder how the hell they'd gotten there so quickly. It happened on my first day conducting research in the border town of Nogales, Mexico. I'd spent the sweltering morning sitting, inside the, sitting in the shade, talking with recently deported migrants. These were women and men who had just attempted and failed to walk across the Sonora Desert of Arizona to illegally enter the United States. I didn't know his name, but I'd seen him earlier in the day. Among the tired masses of deportees, he didn't stand out. Recently repatriated people are easy to spot in Nogales because of the uniformity of their appearance. Dark t-shirts with powdery salt rings under the armpits and circling the neck. Sneakers that look like they've been through a meat grinder. Dusty black backpacks stuffed with extra socks, a few cans of food, and whatever meager personal possessions they've managed to hold on to. Their brown bodies broadcast exhaustion and vulnerability like a scarlet letter. Faces show a mix of sorrow, weariness, fear, and optimism. These folks may have walked for three days lost, quenched a paralyzing thirst at a cattle trough where the water was mostly algae and swimming insects, been robbed at gunpoint by bandits, and raped by a border patrol agent before being deported. But still, the next time is going to be different. Everyone thinks the next time is going to be different. There's a husband waiting in North Carolina, a job painting houses in Phoenix, Arizona. A little girl with an empty belly back in the tiny village of El Manchon Guerrero. Si Dios quiere, voy a pasar. God willing, I'll get through. The next time is going to be different. But I don't remember what he looked like when he was alive. In fact, I didn't notice him at all until I was making my way towards a convenience store, a block from where I'd been conducting interviews. Like many people who get caught in the cycle of repeated crossing attempts, he decided to spend the morning drinking beer, deciding what to do next. I passed him a few hours prior as he headed to an abandoned field across from the store. I took more notice of the early happy hour he was having than its actual facial features. All I remember is that he was tall and skinny and had a shaved head. The next time I saw him was when I spotted a crowd gathering near the abandoned field. I walked up to investigate and found myself standing behind a chain link fence with several migrants, including a short bald man I would soon come to know as Chucho. For ten minutes, Chucho and I stared in silent awe at the limp body flopped on the dirt. This dude had been dead for less than an hour, and yet the flies were already there in full force. They were landing on his milky eyeballs and crawling in and out of his open mouth. His head was turned and facing the crowd of migrants. He seemed to be staring right through everyone. We watched flies lay eggs on this man's face for what seemed like an eternity. Finally, a good Samaritan showed up with a Dallas Cowboys bedsheet and covered him up. A paramedic and a few of the neighbors milled around the corpse chatting, but no one seemed to be phased. Death lay there like a casual summer breeze. I thought to myself that maybe this guy was headed to Dallas to, watch, to wash dishes at an Applebee's or a Denny's restaurant. Maybe he hated the Pinchy's Cowboys after spending too many years in Philadelphia doing landscaping jobs and rooting for the Philadelphia Eagles. No one seemed to know him. They just knew that he needed to be covered up to keep the flies away. I turned to Chucho for some insight into this spectacle. 
He shrugged and said, this happens all the time. Some people get tired of trying to cross the border after many failed attempts. Some turn to drugs and alcohol to kill time, but who knows what killed him? He reads the worry on my face and continues, you watch, no one will remember this tomorrow. It's like it didn't happen. And he was right. I would ask migrants the next day about the dead body in the field 300 feet from where we were sitting and no one would know what I was talking about. It was almost as if it didn't happen. So that little vignette is just to, um, to sort of set the stage for uh, the, the talk today uh, and, and revolving around really the, the theme of, of my migrant death uh, in the Sonora Desert of Arizona. And just to give us a little bit of architecture for the talk here, um, uh, as, as, as Susan mentioned, much of this is based on a, a recent book that I've, that I've just completed, um, and so I'm just pulling a few of the sort of main points from that. Uh, but to, to set up this talk today, I'm going to first introduce uh, the U.S. border policy known as prevention through deterrence and give some historical background on that. Then I will talk about uh, the archaeological concept of taphonomy and how I use it to understand uh, various forms of postmortem violence that occur um, against migrant bodies. And then I'm going to tell um, a, a few stories about different types of deaths that migrants experience, um, being erased, being returned, and being thrown into the unknown. And I think if there's any take-home messages from today, there's probably just two um, that I'd want to leave you with. And the first one is that the migrant deaths that happen in the Arizona desert are by no means unintended consequences of our current border enforcement policies there. These are direct, purposeful consequences. And two, um, the things that happen to migrant bodies, the postmortem violence that I'm going to talk about, are um, incredibly traumatic and far-reaching um, and cannot be separated from um, the American um, uh, political um, sphere. And so much of the work I'm going to talk about today comes from the Undocumented Immigration Project, which is this long-term project that I've, been, that I've been directing since about 2009. And really, it's my attempt to understand um, the social process of undocumented migration in a variety of contexts. Uh, much of what I'm talking about today revolves around the U.S.-Mexico border. My current work now is really looking at, at Central American migrants crossing through Mexico. Uh, but uh, it's been an attempt to draw on the four fields of anthropology, so archaeology, linguistics, forensic science, um, um, sociocultural anthropology, and all the methods that, that are available to me to, to, to understand this process. And so what that's, what that's included is doing long-term ethnographic work in migrant shelters, um, doing lots of ethnographic work with migrants as they prepare to, to, to cross the border. So here we've got some folks um, packing their bags here ready to, to head into the desert. Um, I've given migrants disposable cameras and other forms of um, uh, other types of, of digital media to capture the experience from their own perspective. So this is just a, a shot here taken by someone with a disposable camera en route. Um, I've applied uh, very much the same methodologies that we would expect to see in um, in archaeological investigations in the ancient past to understand these, this contemporary and highly politicized social process. And I've also been um, uh, moving more and more into the realm of forensic science to understand what happens uh, to, to the bodies of migrants and how those things can be um, uh, understood within the context of, of, of American uh, politics. And so I think before I get into the, the, the discussion of migrant death, um, we have to get up to speed in terms of what the current U.S. border policy looks like um, on the U.S.-Mexico border. And so prevention through deterrence is a term that I'm going to throw around um, quite a bit. You may or may not know, up until the early 1990s, border crossings happened um, on the U.S.-Mexico border pretty much uh, on a daily basis within, um, within broad daylight. So you could drive down to a place like San Diego, San Ysidro um, in Southern California. You could go to El Paso, Texas on the, on the U.S.-Mexico border, and you could see people hopping the fence and running into downtown El Paso or running into downtown San Ysidro in broad daylight. And politically, this is a very, um, this is not something that you want on the front page of the LA Times or the New York Times if you're a politician who's claiming to be tough on border security. Um, this was, a, was very much a, uh, um, uh, an eyesore for, for many politicians, for local community members, to see this stuff happening on a daily basis and people complaining about the U.S. not being tough on, uh, on immigration enforcement. And so starting in the early 1990s, or right around 1993, um, in, in El Paso, Texas um, first, and then this, this ex ex extended across the entire U.S.-Mexico border, um, a, a few policy documents were put forth to try to revamp 
Americans, America's border policies to make them less visible, um, to basically to, to, to get rid of this, and to find ways to, to, to increase border security and at the same time make it more in, invisible to the general public. And there was a document published in 1994 called the, the Strategic Plan, and it, it went through many iterations after this. Um, but the, the key points of the Strategic Plan that Border Patrol put forth are two things. The first was a recognition that the U.S.-Mexico border is a very um, remote place in, in most places. San Diego, El Paso, these are, these are urban, small urban centers, but in between them there are hundreds if not thousands of miles of just remote wilderness. Um, as this document states here, there's deserts, rivers, um, which can form natural barriers to, um, to, to, to migration. And also things like um, extreme temperatures can be used to, um, um, uh, to, to slow down illegal traffic. So the first was a recognition that the border has this incredibly difficult terrain to get across in between urban centers. But more importantly was a recognition that these natural environments, these, um, these places known for ex extreme temperatures, rugged terrain, venomous animals, could in fact be exploited by the Border Patrol to, to make it more difficult for migrants to get, to get across the border. Um, and really, the, the, the sort of key point here is if if you can make it impossible to cross in urban centers where people can hop the fence and run into downtown um, San Diego and, 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 and get into the local population, it becomes very difficult to find people. But if you make it impossible to cross in an urban port of entry and, and folks have to come across the, these remote areas, they're going to get beat up by the natural environment and they're also going to be really easy to, to pick out of, um, you know, from a helicopter or just out on a trail. But the idea was if they were forced over this more difficult um, in, uh, terrain, which actually here referred to as a hostile terrain, that this would be better suited for, for border enforcement. So basically, let's use a natural environment to, um, to, to slow down migrants. And the joke is always that Arizonans hate Mexicans, hate migrants. That is, in the US, that is, is very much a, um, a common misconception, I think. Um, I've come to, to very much appreciate Arizona as a state, as a, as a very diverse uh, ethnically, um, a very progressive sort of state, in, at least in the, in, in the South. But generally, the, um, the sort of uh, extreme right in Arizona has a very intense anti-immigrant rhetoric. And one of the things that, it, it, that revolves from this is not the fact that it's, it's just straight xenophobia, but it is the fact that for many years, uh, many parts of the U.S.-Mexico border were impossible to cross. So San Diego, heavily, heavily enforced still. El Paso, very difficult to get through there. But for close to 20 years, we left the back door of southern Arizona completely wide open. And so millions of people have tried to cross through southern Arizona since 2000. Um, something like... Um, you know, over five million people have been caught in this little tiny strip of air in Arizona between two, 2000 and about 2012. So, so basically the size of Houston, Texas coming through this, this desert area. But this was done on purpose. Um, you know, the idea was that this is what the Arizona desert looks like, at least in the valleys, it gets much more mountainous in certain areas. But this is a cheaper form of border enforcement. If you have to walk 100 miles um, through this terrain, the likelihood is that you're gonna get injured, you may die, but this is gonna slow you down. And so this is a purposeful attempt to use the natural terrain as a form of border enforcement. And this was not without its um, um, humanitarian consequences, ones that were actually quite recognized early on by the policymakers who, who, who designed this thing. So in, in a series of documents that were published in the late 90s, um, there were several key points made by, by these um, strategists. One was that they could determine if prevention through deterrence was successful by measuring the an increase, if there was an increase in, in migrant fatalities in association with this, they would deem this policy being effective. So basically a death toll would signal that this was in fact working. And very early on also recognizing that if, if they shift people away from urban ports of entry where they now have to walk for 60, 70, 100 miles through, um, you know, um, uh, close to 200 kilometers through, through uh, this very difficult terrain, the deaths are gonna increase. That was recognized very, very early on um, that, that this would be a direct impact of this policy. And so, and I've argued in the book and, and elsewhere that for the policymakers, and for, and I think for much of the uh, the American public, this is oftentimes viewed as just uh, 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 the cost of doing border enforcement business. 
that it, migrants are going to die because of this, but so maybe they should stop coming. I mean, that, that, that's been the, the perspective from these policymakers and from the Border Patrol and from, and from, and from, from many others. Um, they've backpedaled on that now recently, and um, I'd be happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But very early on, the people who designed this policy recognized that this was going to happen. And this is the dominant paradigm that we currently use. It's still in place now, um, and we've actually started to now push this into, into Mexico, which I would be happy to talk about as well um, in, in relationship to, to Central American migration. And if we just look at some of the statistics here, in 1993, prevention through deterrence goes, becomes official. And so people are now starting to get pushed into this, um, these more difficult terrains. And depending on who you ask, these are all different numbers of fatalities. The Department of Homeland Security, which is the, the wing, the federal government wing of the United States that, that oversees Border Patrol, they tend to undercount um, uh, the number of fatalities. The um, uh, American Civil Liberties Unity uh, Union has a much higher recognition and, and count for, for, for bodies. Um, but they, people disagree about if a dead body in the desert can be um, attributed to a migrant or not. Um, I tend to use numbers that come from um, a humanitarian group based in Arizona, which is a little difficult to see here, but as of, as of today, 2,908 bodies recovered from this part of southern Arizona since 2000. And I'll talk more about why these numbers, I think, grossly underestimate the number of people who died during this process. But really, the, so the idea just f f from this graph, as soon as this policy goes into place, migrant deaths spike, and they continue to, to, to hover now around a couple hundred um, bodies recovered a year, um, but in, in, in some instances much higher than that, depending on um, the, the, the overall number of people crossing the border at any one time. So that sort of sets the stage for why the people I'm going to talk about today are in the Arizona desert. But I want to give you a sense too first of, of what it looks like to come through this desert. And, um, Migrants who are trying to cross the U.S.-Mexico border recognize that, that there is a routine to this. This, this, is, this is not a, a completely random, um, um, unorganized sort of thing. There is a, there is a, a method to this madness that, that goes on in the Arizona desert. And um, these are two, uh, two gentlemen that I've had the privilege to work with over, over the course of several years. This is Memo on the left and this is Lucho on the right. These are folks that I got to know in a, in a migrant shelter starting around 2009. And you'll see some of their photos that they took when, when they crossed um, in um, the desert that year. Those guys would tell you, if so if you're going to cross the U.S.-Mexico border, um, here we are. This is the U.S.-Mexico border. This is Arizona. Tucson is the kind of first big major city from the border. It's about, um, it's about and, um, 120 kilometers north of, of the Mexican town of Nogales. Um, this is little town of Aravaca on the U.S. side is a major hub for people coming through um, from the border. They're walking through this distance. Uh, this gray kind of circle here represents the survey area that, I, that we worked on the U.S. side. Um, and and, the, the, and the, on the Mexican side, I tended to work in the town of Nogales and down here in the town of, of Altar. Now, if you were to talk to these guys, Memo and Lucho, Mexican migrants, um, Central American migrants, they would tell you, okay, if you want to cross the border through Arizona, Typically, you go to the town of Altar first, and you, this is a town that is a, it's a trucking town, but really, primarily, their work revolves around human smuggling. Um, you go there to meet with your, with your smuggler, in Spanish, a coyote. Um, it's a euphemism for, for smuggler, but the local baseball team, the local sports team there, they're called the, the coyotes of Altar, which in, in Spanish is a, basically, it's a, a double entendre. It's the, the smugglers of Altar, but it's also the name of the, the baseball team. These guys will tell you, you go there, you meet up with your smuggler, um, and they're gonna then drive you down to the border and drop you off into the desert and then lead you across where you then walk from here and try to get to Tucson or, or much farther. And if you go to a place like Altar, the outdoor markets, um, any of you who've ever been to Mexico, the outdoor market is a very big, it's a very big um, occurrence throughout the country. But in, in a place like Altar, they specialize basically in the, the goods that you're going to need to get across the desert. So these are all migration smuggling related sorts of things. Camouflage backpacks, camouflage clothes, hiking boots, first aid equipment, dark clothing, all the things that migrants wear to get through the desert to survive and also to try to evade um, border enforcement. So there's a whole industry that revolves around catering to, to these migrants. Uh, this is another photo taken by, by Memo and Lucho, um, just kind of giving you an example of the, the, the distance that these guys are going to have to travel. When I asked um, Memo about this, this picture uh, the first time I saw it, 
he basically said, we're standing at the U.S.-Mexico boundary right here, and we have to walk between these two mountains. Um, t- Tucson is on the other side of that. This is probably about a, a five or six day walk um, if you're moving really quickly. And um, increasingly, it's gotten difficult to, to cross through these, these more flat valleys. And so many migrants are now going through um, a much more mountainous sort of terrain. And as you see here, I mean, these guys are crossing through um, this very difficult um, uh, um, rugged kind of mountains. They're wearing cheap sneakers. They've got tiny backpacks. They may be carrying a gallon of water, maybe two, um, a little bit of food, but never enough food or, um, um, or supplies to, to get through you know, five, or, five or six days of these journeys. They will eventually have to find water someplace else in the, in the desert. Uh, much of what this crossing looks like, it occurs in, um, in pitch black. So there's no, you, you don't have a compass, you don't have a flashlight. Uh, if you are caught with a compass or a map, Border Patrol oftentimes then will label you as a smuggler and you will then face a more severe jail time as opposed to being arrested and just deported back. So people tend to do this with no, with no kind of guidance. Um, the, the smugglers have things memorized. People learn um, after repeated failures about landmarks, but they're doing this all um, in, in, in pitch darkness. This is one of the most difficult um, um, desert terrains in um, the Western Hemisphere. It seems like everything there has evolved to bite you, scratch you, um, to deliver venomous sorts of bites. So you've got um, all sorts of creatures, rattlesnakes, um, wild, wild boars, um, cactuses. It's a very, very um, uh, un- unpleasant environment if you are not well equipped. And even if you are well equipped, I mean, I go out and hike in this environment with, with $200 sneakers and, and seven liters of water and food, and it's still not an easy hike for, for four or five hours. And these guys are doing it for four or five days. Um, as Memo Lucho would tell you, you could plan for everything and, you ne- and you'll never be completely um, prepared for the unknown. Um, this is just a shot of them crossing in, at the end, of, the end of the Arizona summer, which coincides with monsoon season. So you can be out there where it's 110 degrees and there's no water for, um, to be seen. And then in the, middle of, in the middle of nowhere, all of a sudden a flash flood can occur. And you can, you can drown in one of these giant canyons um, if you are at the bottom of it and can't get out quickly enough. Water will, will come through and, and fill up, and, um, and people have drowned during this process. Uh, I always joke with my students, they say, how do you understand when you know when you've got really good rapport with your, um, the people that you work with? And I say, well, for me, it's when they stop in the middle of one of these very traumatic experiences, and they say, you know what? Jason would really love a photograph of this right now, so let's sort of stop in the middle and, and take a picture. I'm always deeply appreciative of, the, of, of how much work these guys have done um, to help me to tell their stories, and so um, I just want to give them um, um, as, as many thanks as I, as I possibly can. But these guys will tell you that, yeah, I mean, you expect to, to get bit by a rattlesnake, you expect to, to run out of water, you don't necessarily expect to, to be up to your chest in a, in a flash flood. Uh, and days of this is, is incredibly painful. Um, these, are the, these, these are two guys, so here's Memo here, and this is Angel, who was the third person with them on this trip, um, resting after just a couple of days. At this point in the trip, Memo talks about almost dying, about, about vomiting blood. Uh, they, they had run out of water and food, and um, their bodies had just been, had really taken a beating. And it takes days, if not weeks, or months to recover from this stuff, um, both the, the physical trauma and the, um, I think, the psychological trauma of going through um, one, of these, one of these difficult um, border crossings. And as people cross through this, um, you know, you can see here, here is uh, Lucho under a tree. He's got his backpack here, some foot powder, some cream, and some first aid equipment that he's, um, he's, he's pulled out. Um, a lot of times people, when they're crossing the Arizona desert, will leave things behind, either intentionally or unintentionally. Here we've got a photograph of a, of a, of a temporary campsite. These are what we call migrant stations. Uh, it's a pair of pants, a shirt. Uh, someone's made a bed, and they've used a backpack as a pillow and they've left everything there um, for who knows why. I mean, Border Patrol may have shown up and they, and they were arrested. They may have run off because they were scared. They may have been picked up by, by a smuggler in a vehicle and been told to leave everything behind. But, but oftentimes, you will come across the archaeological fingerprint of, of this border crossings. And we've tried to use archaeology to understand what can the things people bring with them and the things they leave behind in the desert tell us about this process. And we've treated these... Uh, these particular instances where we encounter migrant 
possessions as, as archaeological assemblages. So we treat them with the same type of scientific care that we would um, a, a, an ancient archaeological site. So this would be mapped, GPSed, collected, photographed, um, and, then, and then archived. And um, we have a, a fairly large repository of thousands of objects that people have left in the desert that we've collected over the years. And some of these instances, so this is one of these migrant stations um, um, from 2000, around 2009, 2010, where people walk for five, six days, they get to a, meet, a meeting point, the smuggler says, okay, ch take off your clothes, change your clothes, brush your teeth, wash your face, try to make it look like you have not just walked for five or six days. Um, we're gonna put you in a car now and try to drive you through a checkpoint. And so these places where people are getting picked up oftentimes will become these incredibly large accumulations of, of materials. Some of this stuff was meant to be thrown away, water bottles, trash, you know, um, d disposable, uh, you know, consumables. But oftentimes, too, you will recover uh, personal possessions that people did not mean to leave behind. Bibles, family photographs, personal possessions, that valued possessions that were lost during this process. And we've gone through as well and documented this and, and, and collected it and archived it. Um, this material um, has been used in a variety of different contexts. So we've got various exhibits that we've been using um, to try to, um, to show the archaeological fingerprint of this. As I tell my, my American friends, this is American immigration history in the making. Um, in the current political climate, this is a very unpopular. Um, right? in, in the era of Donald Trump and the anti-immigrant rhetoric, this right now is, um, you know, is incredibly unpopular. But I would also argue that you know, Irish immigrants, um, um, Eastern European immigrants were not, were not popular in the 19th century um, and, and in the early 20th century in, in the United States. Ellis Island was not this beacon of, 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 um, of, of hope that the Americans have made it out to be. Um, it's taken 100 years of, of historical amnesia to, to paint it that way. And it's very much the same thing that's going on right now. And so the argument for me is that this has to be documented um, and recorded now before, before we lose it. Uh, and I'm happy to note that the Smithsonian has recently acquired some of this material and will exhibit it in um, starting next year for a very large, um, long, several decade long e exhibition on the history of American immigration. Um, but we've got, I would say now, probably about 10,000 items um, that have been archived from, from this process. So that's sort of to, to set up the, you know, what border crossing looks like, how people prepare for it, why they're in the desert. Um, but I wanna focus more today on people who don't make it and the things that happen to bodies during this, during this, this process. And so I'm just gonna read a little bit and kind of go back and forth between um, talking some, about some slides and then giving you a little bit of dialogue about some of these, um, some of these events. The Norwegian explorer Carl Lumholtz once wrote that the summer heat in the Sonora Desert felt like you were walking between great fires. And I would say that that's putting it quite nicely. Right now, it feels like we're walking directly through flames. It's easily over 100 degrees, and it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. We're climbing through the Tumacacari Mountains uh, with my friend Bob Key. And Bob Key is a member of the Southern Arizona humanitarian group, the Tucson Samaritans. And he's been out um, giving first aid to migrants for, for close to a decade now. Uh, but he's someone who um, has long been a, a collaborator of mine, has, um, a, has taken me through the desert in, um, for many, many trips to try to get a sense of, um, of what the humanitarian work looks like. Um, and Bob is, is someone who has a very um, keen understanding of, of this particular part of the desert. So he's taking us around, and it's a, it's a rough path. Um, it's a, a very um, difficult terrain. There's um, tons of, as I would say, angry mesquite trees that just all seem to be wanting to poke your eyes out as you're trying to get, get through them. Um, and, and Bob says to me, we're almost there, I promise. And I, I force a smile uh, because Bob always lies to me to make me feel better. Because for him, when he says we're almost there, it's usually um, nine or 10 or 15 more kilometers to go, um, if, not, if not 20. Um, but on this day, he's quite serious. He's not joking around. He hasn't been offering to carry me on his back, which he typically does. Um, and Bob is 35 years older than I am. Um, he's, just a, he's a machine. Uh, but he's on a mission. He's really, he's, he's, he's on a mission on this particular day. And we, we turn a corner and we stop. And Bob points and he says, this is where I found the person. The police department came out and took away what we could find, but it was getting dark and we didn't have a lot of time to go over the area. It was mostly arm and leg bones and some pieces of clothing. I wanna see if we can find the head. That would make it easier to identify the body. I'm sure that there are still bones out here. And Bob is right. There are actually quite a few bones that the police overlooked. 
but we have to cover a lot of ground before we find them. There are pieces strewn everywhere. We walk down slope and see part of an articulated arm wedged between two rocks. Outside of the sinew holding the bones together, it's been picked clean of skin and muscle by some unknown creature. We get up the trail and I notice several white flecks that stand out against the red mountain soil. It looks like someone dropped a box of blackboard chalk on the ground. I get close and realize that they are splinters of human bone, mostly sun-bleached rib fragments that have been cracked and gnawed by some long-gone animal. Just off the trail, I spot a complete human tooth lying on top of a rock. This dental find gives us hope that the skull is nearby. We desperately look for this person's head. Rocks are overturned, subterranean nests are probed, our bleeding hands blindly grope under thick brush in hopes of finding bones that may have been squirreled away by scavengers or deposited by monsoon floodwaters. Everyone is moving with great urgency, despite the debilitating heat. After 45 minutes of desperately surveying the surrounding area, we give up. There is no skull. We do, however, come across a worn out pair of hiking boots in close proximity to some of the bones. But where the hell is the skull? I start imagining what has happened to it. There's a montage of laughing vultures ripping this person's eyeballs out of the sockets. I hallucinate two coyotes batting the head around like a ball so that they can access brain matter through the form of magnum. It's a moment when you despise the capacity of the human imagination. People whose loved ones have disappeared in the desert will tell you that it's the not knowing what happened to them, coupled with these flashes of grotesque possibility that drive you literally insane. As we start to walk away, I notice something on the ground. I crouch down and pick up a piece of bone smaller than my fingernail. It immediately crumbles to dust. I try to hand it to Bob to put in a plastic bag, and a breeze passes through and blows many of the particles off of my hand. I scrape what I can off my finger and sprinkle it into the bag, but it's a futile gesture. There is little that forensic scientists can do with bone dust. This person will likely become a line in the local medical examiner's database, and it's gonna read name unknown, age unknown, country of origin unknown, cause of death undetermined partial skeletal remains. The identity of this individual and much of their body has been swallowed up by the desert and there were no witnesses. This person has been reduced to shoes, shards of bone, and the unknown. And that's really what I want to sort of focus on for the second part of this talk today is these bodies that are left in the desert. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of concepts here to, to set up um, the, the, the final part of my talk. Um, the, the first is this idea of taphonomy. Um, and I freely steal from archaeology, sociocultural anthropology, linguistics, um, any and all theoretical uh, concepts, methods uh, to, to try to understand this process. And taphonomy for me has been some, something that's become um, uh, incredibly relevant over the last few years. And it's a very simple, simple concept. Basically, taphonomy is just the things that happen to an organism once it dies. So this is my very crude schematic here. Here's a dinosaur. It dies. It's covered in water. It skeletonizes. It's covered in soil. It fossilizes. It's impacted by various environmental conditions. And eventually, it's excavated, dug up, brought back into the air. These are these biological processes and these cultural processes are all taphonomic. And so when I say, when I talk about taphonomic processes, it's just the things that impact a dead organism. Uh, and for humans, taphonomy, we can think about taphonomy in terms of we're alive when we die. Are we immediately buried? Is burial delayed? Uh, are we cremated? Is, is the person cremated and the ashes are spread? All of these various things that we do to a body, um, these cultural processes and these biological processes are, 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 are taphonomic. And as my friend Shannon Dottie has pointed out, taphonomy has long been in the realm of paleontologists or archaeologists who have been really focused specifically on the environmental aspects. And as she so um, importantly pointed out um, in, in 2006, taphonomy is in fact very much a, um, a social process. The decision to bury or not bury someone, to, to immediately bury, to delay burial, all of those things are, um, are social decisions, and so, which makes taphonomy then um, a, a social process. And as Deborah Komar has noted in her analyses of, um, of the excavation of, 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 of mass graves um, in, in recent years, these differential, the way we treat bodies 
tells us a lot about both the, the victims and the perpetrators. And so we can understand um, social and political processes by looking at how we treat, we, we, we treat um, these, the, these dead individuals. And we've been doing all sorts of things to, um, to, to, dead, to dead bodies that are, that are taphonomic, that are cultural, that are political for probably as, as long as, as we have been um, in existence as, as humans. And um, this is just a, photo, a very famous Time Life photo of a, an, an American woman writing back to her, um, her, her American uh, boyfriend who was serving overseas in World War II in Japan, um, thanking him for the, quote, nice Jap skull that he had sent her in the mail. Um, but the, the decision to, to remove someone's head, to put it in a box, to send it away, to put it on a mantle, these are, these are both taphonomic and, and, and cultural processes. And this tells us a lot about, about cultural perspectives on um, the living, of the living and, and, and the dead. And so my argument for, for this next part of the talk is basically the differential treatment of, of migrant bodies is, 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 is political, it can involve animals, it can involve the environment, and it's all intertwined, but the differential taph taphonomic treatment that we see happening in the Arizona desert um, is in fact quite violent. And so I'm gonna use this concept of necroviolence to, to, to talk about postmortem taphonomy, to talk about postmortem treatment of, of the dead. And um, clearly, waging war on the dead is by no means a new cultural phenomenon. Humans have been doing it for millennia with fervor. You can think about Achilles dragging the lifeless body of Hector around the city of Troy, disgruntled Aztecs mounting the heads of conquistadors and their horses on skull racks in, uh, in downtown Mexico City. It's a not so subtle message to Cortez and his men that it is time for them to um, evacuate. Uh, we can think about Catholics during the French Wars of Religion feeding the bodies of Protestants to crows and dogs in hopes that they would carry their souls to hell. And as Foucault notes, these excesses of violence are what make them glorious to perpetrators and allow for torture to extend beyond the moment a person stops breathing. And to quote Foucault, corpses burnt, ashes thrown to the winds, bodies dragged on hurdles and exhibited at roadside. Justice pursues the body beyond all possible pain. Um, and these different engagements with the dead are what I would term necroviolence. This is violence performed and produced through the specific treatment of corpses that are perceived to be um, offensive, sacrilegious, or inhumane by the perpetrator, the victim and their family, the cultural group, or both. But unlike um, Achille and Bembe's um, necropolitics, which is a theoretical concept that really focuses on the capacity to kill or let live that's, that we associate with modernity and the exercise of sovereignty, when I talk about necroviolence, it's really about the corporeal mistreatment and its generative capacity for violence through time. So ancient, modern, in all sorts of contexts. And um, this is, a, as I said, a very long-standing practice. This is not something that I invented. I just basically put a name to, to something that we've been doing for, 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 for quite a while. Um, and it transcends cultural, geographic, and political boundaries. And it has a diverse range of forms and functions. In some cases, the Postmortem violence that we that we aim at a, at, a, at a victim is intended to to torture to um, uh, to bring harm to their spirit their soul to their afterlife and we can think about many many examples of that um, in the Iliad when Diomedes tells Paris that quote he who faces my spear shall redden the earth with his blood and there shall be more vultures about his body than um, than mourners right? the implication here is that the body will be desecrated and and his soul will be robbed of proper funeral rites. We can think about manipulated dead bodies in other contexts as a way to send violent messages. Um, Mexican drug cartels in modern times, hanging the corpses of their rivals from bridges, skewering their heads on fence posts, and dressing bodies in costume for media photo ops. You don't have to speak Spanish to understand the message intended when someone rolls a bag of severed heads onto a dance floor in Michoacan. Do not test us because our violence knows no bounds. But rather than viewing these intense forms of, of, of performances as senseless or random, uh, as my colleague Rocio Magana would, would state, this is, this is necroviolence as a technique of terror that has been a recurrent theme in the construction of state authority and sovereignty. And archeologists, I think, for, probably for the longest period of time have been, have been most concerned with the postmortem treatment and mistreatment of, uh, of the dead. But more, I think, for me, the most troubling part of this we could think about necroviolence in its most extreme form for me is the complete destruction of a corpse, the complete erasure. Um, this is probably the most complex and durable form of necroviolence that we've yet invented. 
Because we know that the lack of a body prevents a proper burial for the dead, but it also allows for the perpetrators of this violence plausible deniability. And we can think about many historical examples um, to, to attest to this as a, as a political act. We can think about dissidents in Argentina's dirty war uh, who were oftentimes um, naked and sedated when they were dropped out of airplanes into the ocean, forever exiled into the status of, um, of the disappeared. Although these types of practices, the, the disappearance of a body might appear more subtle when compared to the displays of severed heads and limbs, having no corpse is arguably more sinister in that it robs your enemy or it robs, it robs the victim of a, of a voice and agency and it conf confines these traces of repression to the purely um, you know, discursive domain. And we can think about Mexico in, in 2014, the missing 43 students from Ayotzinapa as probably the most um, um, kind of recent example from that, from that context or the most public example of something that's been recurring in Latin America for, for, for many, many decades. And this complete destruction of these bodies, you know, it, it prevents the proper funeral rites from, from taking place. It stunts the necessary relationships that the living need to make with the dead to make sense of, of, of these deaths. Um, and it's just, it's what I'm most concerned about lately is the complete erasure and destruction of these bodies. And so we can think about prevention through deterrence then as being involved in the construction of, of a particular context-specific form of necroviolence. Um, if we extend beyond the Arizona border, we're looking at probably now cl close to 7,000 bodies recovered since the late 1990s. And these numbers, um, you take them with a grain of salt, I mean, plus or minus several hundred, if not several thousand. Um, for me, when I started this work, there was a lot of speculation about what actually happened to people who died in, in the Arizona desert. Um, we, ha we had no good scientific data on this. And so in order to understand the taphonomic processes that were impacting bodies, I decided to conduct some uh, experiments to, uh, to, to understand this process. And so this is, a, I'll give you an image warning here from some experiments that we conducted using um, animals as, as proxies for the human body. Um, the previous work that had been done on Arizona decomposition was, was very much anecdotal and, and very limited. And in 2012, we began, the, the Undocumented Immigration Project, the UMP, began the first in, in series of experiments to understand this process. And in order to do this, um, I basically just followed the standard, standard model that forensic scientists use. Pigs are the closest analogy, mammalian analogy for the human body. They've got a very similar organ distribution, skin type, um, uh, hair distribution and hair type, um, weight. We use pigs in all sorts of forensic experiments we, um, to understand how, uh, how they decompose, how they're impacted by different environmental conditions, and then we use these pigs and, and that data as analogies for, for, um, for, for human bodies. And so we did this starting in 2012, and what basically what that in involved was um, killing animals on sites, and I'd be happy to talk about the ethics of this and the, the difficult decision this was to, to undertake um, um, to, to, to do this. I mean, here we are trying to understand violence against humans, and we're perpetuating it against these, these animals, and um, I, I would be more than happy to talk about this in more detail. Um, these animals were, were, were killed on site. We dressed them in clothes similar to what migrants wear, so um, black shirts, uh, jeans, we put shoes and socks on them, we gave them personal effects. You can see here I'm putting um, a, a piece of paper with someone's phone number inside of a wallet, and this wallet will then be put into this animal's pants. Um, and we monitored this process um, in different contexts. We put, we put some in shade, we put some in direct sunlight, we covered some in rocks, uh, and then we, we used um, motion sensor cameras, which I'll show in a minute, that um, whenever something moves in, in within frame, it records video and, and, um, and takes um, a series of images. And we monitored these animals over six weeks um, during the, the course of these field works to see who was in fact, what animals were eating these, these pigs and what did it look like. This is footage from um, experiments in 2012. This animal here, you can see rigor mortis is already set in. This is one foot, this is the other foot. One shoe has already come off. The head is over here. This animal has been dead for um, about 30 hours. Um, it had been previously noted that, that wildlife biologists had said that typically no more than five to six vultures will eat together at any one time. When we ran these experiments, we had in some instances over 30 animals eating at one time 
um, but I'll just show a, a very short clip of what this looked like. And these experiments for us and for, I think for many people become more and more difficult to view when you start to think about those, those animals as being um, placeholders for humans, for, for sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, brothers. Um, uh, and just to give you a, a brief sort of summary of what we found with the taphonomic stuff, we did not expect scavenging to happen as quickly as it did. Um, in some instances, Less than, less than 24 hours for a carcass to be completely defleshed. Um, in many instances, personal effects were moved over 40 meters from, original, from the original site. I mean, so you could have a, a, an animal or a person die here and their wallet and their shoes could be outside in the courtyard. You'd never know that it was there. I mean, the police don't do a very, um, a very thorough survey. When they, look, they basically see what they can find. These are, these are, these are non-US citizens, so there's very little investment in doing good forensic uh, research on the ground by the, by the police. Um, and we also basically found some very surprising results. Like when we made cairns, when we covered up my uh, pig, uh, pig bodies with, with rocks as a way to protect them from the environment, it actually sped up um, scavenging because the rocks heated the, heated the corpses and, um, and animals were able to get in there much quicker. So they actually had the reverse effect. And migrants had told us that they had been doing this if someone died in their group, covering them with rocks. And this actually sped up the process um, um, immensely. So with that in mind, my, the, sort of the, the last part of my talk now revolves around um, um, some two related um, instances of, 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 of death in the desert. And so after we started this experiment in, um, in, in 2012, about two weeks after we started those experiments, this event happened. The eight of us stand around her in silent awe. It's obvious that not everyone has seen a corpse be before because someone asks if she is really dead. She's lying face down in the dirt and it appears that she has perished while attempting to get up the hill. To get here, she easily walked over 40 miles and had to cross through the Tumacacari Mountains. Rigor mortis has set in and her fingers have started to curl. Her ankles are swollen to the point that it looks like her sneakers will pop off at any moment. The back of her hands are stained with excrement and bubbling with copper colored fluids that have been expelled from her body upon death. She's been dead only a few days and is in what forensic anthropologists term early decomposition. Quote, gray to green discoloration, some flesh relatively fresh, bloating, brown to black discoloration of arms and legs. But I'll tell you what, these descriptions don't do justice to what bodies left in the desert actually look like, smell like, or sound like. Nothing does. Against the quiet backdrop of the desert, you can hear the buzzing of flies busily laying eggs on her and in her. There's also a steady hissing of intestinal gases escaping from her bloated and distended stomach. It sounds like a slow leaking tire. After several days in the sweltering summer heat, her body has begun to change. Her skin has started to blacken and mummify, and the bloating is beginning to obscure some of her physical features. While parts of her are starting to transform into unfamiliar shapes and colors, her striking jet black hair and the ponytail holder wrapped around her right wrist hint at the person she once was. I ask a student to get a blanket out and we cover her up. It makes those of us still alive feel better. But high above us, vultures circle her corpse. I count at least four of them and marvel at how quickly they've arrived on the scene. I try to ignore them. I get close to the body and awkwardly scribble down more field notes. No backpack or obvious personal possessions. She's got a bottle of electrolyte fluids under her shoulder and face, but, that's, but not much else. Later, I go and sit with a group of students under a, short distance, uh, under a tree a short distance from the body. And the silence among us is tense and only occasionally broken when a breeze comes through and rustles the branches of nearby mesquite trees. Out of the blue, someone starts crying uncontrollably and is immediately consoled by a neighbor's kind embrace. Others sigh deeply and someone angrily walks off into the distance to be alone. We sit quietly for what seems like an eternity. Vultures continue to circle overhead. 
they are simultaneously implicated in and oblivious to the complex human drama playing out below them. All they know is that we've disrupted their lunch plans. I try to say something to the group of students that I'm with, it's about six undergrads and a couple of graduate students, that will make us feel comfortable or make this death seem peaceful or dignified. But it's probably the dumbest thought I've ever had. Because there's nothing that you can say in this scenario that doesn't sound contrived. Months later, someone will corner me after I give a talk similar to this one, and they will complain that the photo I showed of this woman robbed her of her dignity. But I will point out that the types of deaths that migrants experience in the Sonora Desert are anything but dignified. That is the point. This is what prevention through deterrence looks like. These photographs should make us all uncomfortable because the uncomfortable reality is that right now corpses lay rotting on the desert floor and there aren't enough witnesses. But these photos also provide compelling evidence that contrary to what Susan Sontag says, we don't need to go to exotic places to get full frontal views of the dead and dying. They live in our backyard. Sitting there on a dusty afternoon, I finally blurred out, at least we got here before the vultures did. Cuenca, Ecuador. Her name was Carmita Maricela Zaguipuyas, and she was 31 years old when she decided to leave her husband and three children in Cuenca in early June of 2012 to try to make it to the United States. She was abandoned by her smuggler after she became ill and was unable to continue walking. She likely died from a combination of hyperthermia and a pre-existing kidney condition. One of the last things that Maricela said to her family in Ecuador was, quote, my kids are dying of hunger here. My kids are suffering. Whatever my destiny is, I must go. After finding her body, I made contact with Maricela's family in Ecuador and in New York. And one of the biggest themes of our many conversations revolved around the condition that her body was in when we found it and when it was returned to Cuenca. As her best friend and sister-in-law, Christina, told me, in, a, in January 2014, she says, they told us not to open the coffin, but I wanted to see Maricela. My plan had been for her to get to Ecuador and then we would change her clothes. They said she was really messed up, so I wanted to put new clothes on her for the burial. But when she got here, there was no face, there was no hands. They had to remove her hands so that they could rehydrate the fingertips to take, um, to get her finger, to, the fingertips to take her fingerprints. The coffin was a mess. She laid unembalmed for almost a month in Southern Arizona in cold storage. And then Christina continues, she says, the wood was dripping wet and it didn't look like her. There were doubts that it really was her, that maybe she's still alive out there hiding in the desert. What we want to know is how, how she was when you found her. Because when she got here, she was destroyed. It's like it's, not, it's like it's not really her. I need to see photos of the body. Here's Christina looking at these photos that we brought her after this event. And she tells me, in, in this particular instance in Ecuador, she says, if this is her buried here, well, thank God we have the body. It's a miracle of God that she came back to us. Maricela is only half complete, but she came back. She came back. And if it's her, it helps us to move forward. But what I'm telling you, it's very difficult to believe that this is how she is. It was very hard to see her in this form. If seeing the ravaged body of someone that you love is the physical manifestation of necroviolence in the Sonora Desert, then having no corpse is its spectral form. Maybe with time and therapy, or perhaps enough alcohol or drugs, legal or otherwise, a person can learn to block out images of sawed off hands, putrefied flesh, or worm eaten faces. And maybe you didn't open the coffin so you never saw what happened to your husband's body. You were just happy to have him back. You can always grip those wrinkled photos of the good times or catch glimpses of him in the faces of your children. The kids remind you of who he was or she was and the beauty and vitality that once lived in that person's eyes. But how does one grieve when there are no bones to mourn over, no coffin to keep sealed tight? How do you move on when the uncertainty of what happened to someone you love will not let you? Clinical psychologist Pauline Boss calls this ambiguous loss, a loss that remains unclear. Not knowing where your loved one is, whether they are dead or alive, is traumatizing and it, it, uh, and long-lasting. It, quote, freezes the grieving process and renders closure an impossibility. And it is the form, I would argue, of necroviolence that is seemingly without end. And for me, I, this happened in, 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 20, uh, in, in 2012, and I thought that this is probably the worst that it was ever going to get for me in, in, the, in the context of this work. And that was until I got a message from, um, from Christina via Facebook 
almost two days to the year after we found Maricela's body. And she sends me this message where it basically says, can you help us? We've got a cousin who's gone missing in the desert. And so I became involved with this missing person's case, um, a, rel a relative of Maricela. And I just, and I want to end on, 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 on this story. Um, I go to New York to interview family members who were with this person who went missing. And one of them was a 13 year old cousin who was on the trail um, when this relative went, um, went missing. And Felipe, this cousin says to me, quote, we were in the desert for five days. The water ran out. Jose, which is his name, he kept stopping to sit and drink water. There were few people left at this point. A lot stayed behind because their feet were hurting. We got to the start of a hill and Jose fell down. His leg gave out and he just slumped on the ground. He said he'd had enough, he couldn't go on. The guide came over, the smuggler, and said, you need to get up or I'm going to beat you. He started kicking him and Jose kept saying, yeah, okay, but Jose couldn't get up. He was sitting on the ground looking, all, looking dazed. We left him with some water and we went to get help. We were picked up by immigration two days later. This is who they left behind. 15-year-old Jose Maria Tacuri. I go to New York to talk to Jose's parents about why he was coming, what, what had happened, how this scenario had sort of un unfolded. And so I'm in Long Island, New York, talking to Jose's dad. And this is what he tells me. He says, when I was in Cuenca, Jose, my son, was my right hand. He was always with me. We were inseparable. But I came to this country, when I came to this country though, he became very rebellious. I would call him and I would say, Jose, why have you changed? And he would say to me, no dad, no papi, it's your fault. You left me. We were like brothers. You were my everything and you left me here in Ecuador. It's your fault that I'm like this. And Jose had gotten very wild, had been drinking and smoking and going out all hours of the night with his friends. Um, both his parents had gone to New York uh, to try to send money home. And his dad says to him, look, I did not come to New York because I wanted to. I came here to get ahead because in Ecuador, I can't give you the things that you need. And then his dad says, I left when Jose was 10 to provide for him and my family, but he didn't understand these things at the time. I kept asking him why he was acting up. I asked him why he had changed from being such a good kid. And all he would say was that he wanted to come to New York, but I didn't understand why. He had everything there in Cuenca. He kept saying that my wife and I were to blame, that it was our fault, that he felt empty inside. Jose said that he would go home to the home that he shared with his grandmother and his siblings, and none of us would be there. He told me that being reunited with us would fill the emptiness that he had inside. And so Jose calls his dad in May of 2013, right before he goes into the desert. His parents had come up with several thousand dollars um, to try to get him to, to New York. And so Jose calls his dad right before he goes into the desert. And his dad tells me, the last time I spoke to my son, he said, Dad, I really want to talk to you. And I said, okay, let's talk. And he says, not like this. I want to talk face to face because it's been five years since we've, we've talked like father and son. And so he says, okay, I'll wait for you. And when you get to New York, you can tell me what's bothering you. Jose never told his dad what he wanted to talk about. His dad tells me, I guess he met a girl in Ecuador and they went out for about six months. They were together before he left and this girl got pregnant. I guess this is what he wanted to tell me that this girl was pregnant and would I help him? I didn't tell him, but to this day, I'm gonna support the girl that they were going to have. Um, Maria Jose was born in November of 2013, five months after, four months after Jose went missing. I never got to tell my son that I'm not going to abandon him or her, but that is a remorse that I have, that I could never tell him face to face that I was gonna support him. And then Jose's dad tells me, his girlfriend calls every day to see if we have some news about my son, to see if we know something about him, to see if we've spoken to anyone. But I say, no, there is no news. Neither one of his parents have papers, so they cannot travel to Arizona to look for, his, to look for their son. Um, there's very little support to do as this sort of um, um, investigative work. And his dad tells him, it's very difficult to say no, to say that we have nothing. She thinks that we are here doing nothing, that we aren't calling anyone, that we aren't trying to help, that my son is lost and we are just sitting here but that's not true. We're trying to find anyone that might know something about him, to know something uh, about where he is. 
But until we do know something, we'll never get back that joy that we've lost. There's nothing we can do, he tells me. To lose my son like this and not know what happened to him is going to make us cry for the rest of our lives. Every day that passes, I feel more and more out of control. Sometimes it feels like I'm losing the battle, he tells me. I try to wake up with energy some days and say, we are going to find him, we are going to find him. And it's difficult to live like this, now going on three years, to know nothing. And then he says to me, I just pray to God that we will somehow be reunited with Jose in some form or another. Thank you.